This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. I thought it would be great to continue the Minor Prophets series, especially given the fact that the mainstream media and our popular toxic culture is intent on promoting the Babylonian disgusting religion, uh, the Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub religion of Luciferianism. We're going to see that as a prevalent theme running throughout a lot of pop culture, media, etc. And that makes the Minor Prophets all the more relevant. That means that we don't live in such different times as the Prophets and the Patriarchs. So that's why we have to listen to their message because in so many cases what happens is that when the Israelites go along with this, when they give in to this, it leads to their own weakening and their own destruction. And that's what the Minor Prophets so often warn about, what they what they worry about, what they fret about, what they're trying to get the Israelites to avoid is their own destruction. And the same thing applies nowadays to us in the collapsing West, in collapsing Christendom, that these, these same satanic Luciferian principles are being inculcated throughout the culture by very powerful interests. And that's, that's by design. So the major theme here is that we have to take serious God's justice. That's going to be the major theme of Amos. And this is about 750 B.C. He's commemorated in June in the Orthodox Liturgy. And again, if these, these prophets are commemorated in the Orthodox Liturgy, that means that none of the modernist and so-called Orthodox have the right to remove these people uh, as if they are... Uh, at least, basically propping up the Marcionite heresy, that there's this radical discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If there was, then these people wouldn't be commemorated in the liturgy. You have the southern tribes of Judah being taken captive by the Babylonians and the northern being taken captive by the Assyrians. So the book begins by discussing the covenant, and this is the way that God relates to his people. We saw that throughout in the last lecture. Uh, on Hosea, and it's and it's a continual theme, and it's no different now. This is still how uh, we relate to God as a covenantal relationship in the church, and the Orthodox Study Bible notes actually get that correct. And here there is a covenant lawsuit that's being filed here. Uh, God is is first of all speaking of His judgment on the nations, and He speaks of an earthquake, a, a, a period in which there's going to be a radical change of of operations in terms of how God deals with things. And that change, I don't mean that, that God himself is going to change, but there's going to be a big change, a big shakeup in power relations. And this is referring to the first century. This is referring to when the Messiah comes, the Messianic prediction in chapter 1 of a universal global shakeup. And that's exactly what happened, was that we did have the removal of the Mosaic administration, the beginning of the church at Pentecost in Acts 2, and the, the beginning of the spread of this reversal of Babel. If you remember the story of Babel, the nations are confused and they're given different languages, right? And this is a way to prevent a giant single global empire. This is reversed in Acts 2 at Pentecost. And we see then all the nations speaking in unison, the Holy Spirit allowing everybody to hear what's being spoken. And that is signifying the reversal of the the punishment of the justice of Babel. And of course, outside of the church, what happens, as you can imagine, the nations, they always tend to try to move back towards the creation of a global one world order. And that's what we see now. We see the the, the globalists, the, the new world order, so to speak, uh, the satanic Luciferian agenda. It, se it seeks to then create, once again, Babel. But church, the church is the reversal of Babel. It is the one holy Catholic and apostolic institution that's universal for all people that brings man back into covenantal relationship with God. So that's why God is executing the, the covenant lawsuit here, because just as we saw in Hosea, uh, Amos is talking about the unfaithfulness of Israel. Israel has violated the marriage covenant. And God backs up the death penalty here. Uh, there's no there's no removal of the death penalty once Jesus came. That's a big misunderstanding that the furtherance of pacifism in a country is actually part of foreign intelligence operations. Foreign nations, foreign governments, globalists uh, uh, 
corporate elite, they will actually promote pacifism through different foundations and NGOs to weaken a culture. So, and Jesus in the New Testament, by the way, Romans 13, many, many places backs up the death penalty. There's absolutely no basis for the removal of the death penalty or pacifism. And we want to notice, too, that, that after the judgment on the nations, which is signifying not just this time period in which God's going to judge these nations in 750 BC, but it also is a predictive messianic prediction, as we said, of the first century when the real judgment happened, when Christ came, when he ascended into heaven, which, sig- which signified the uh, beginning of the millennial reign, right? For us, the millennial reign is not some thousand-year thing. It's the entire period of the church. Uh, once Christ became incarnate and ascended. When he ascended, he sat down at the right hand of the Father uh, in the heavens, and then he rules the entire earth now. And the earth is being subjected to his rule throughout history. That's why the inclusion of the Gentiles into the covenant signifies that messianic period. Now, the pagan nations uh, are also judged on the standard of God's moral law, which shows that there's not some bogus situation where God doesn't care about what anybody else does and it's only the Israelites the very sort of uh, arrogant assumption on the part of many of the Israelites was that that God doesn't even care about the other nations they don't exist uh, why did he send Jonah to preach repentance to the Ninevites if they don't if that doesn't matter in fact that's the whole message of Jonah and here we see the the pagan nations being held to the violation of God's moral law right it wasn't like only in Israel did you have to keep the Ten Commandments. No, it was wrong everywhere because those Ten Commandments actually signified the basic moral law, which are a reflection of God's character. So I want to mention that in chapter 2, what's fascinating is that there is the judgment against not just the nations and not just the apostate Israelites who have gone along with this Luciferian religion, but also... Uh, there's a mention of human trafficking and there's a prediction of the betrayal of Christ for for silver Um, the righteous are sold for silver and then it talks about the poor being purchased for the price of a pair of sandals so you could actually uh, trade in your Colin Kaepernick Nikes your 666 Nikes for a personal slave my personal Nike slave boy. Uh, now you say, oh, that that's crazy. Uh, all that ancient stuff. Well, aren't Nikes made in sweatshop slave factories? So actually it's not that different, is it, from, uh, from then to now. And so human trafficking is mentioned, as we said. God says, I will put to death and the judge from her midst. I will slay her princes. And this is where he begins talking about Israel and Judah as also deserving the same punishments and chastisements as the nations. So even though there was a covenant with Israel and they were supposed to be the light to the nations, as Deuteronomy says, uh, they completely failed at that task. And ultimately the culmination of that failure was in the crucifixion of Christ. So the point is that there's a standard for both people. And that standard ultimately is the basic moral law. And again, remember that that even the ceremonial law, which had a good, it had a foresignifying typological factor to it, even that was not ultimately what made you right with God, right? We're going to see that in the minor prophets as well. Uh, Paul says that the righteous man shall live by faith. So the, the point being that, that many Israelites would go through the, the ritual motions of ex- external ceremonies uh, and none of those ceremonies made you right with God if your heart wasn't right. And that principle still applies. You can go to all the liturgies you want. You can go through all the rituals and, and trappings and all the smells and bells. Uh, and, but if your heart's not right, if you aren't truly repentant, it doesn't matter. It's useless, worthless. I'm, I'm, what does God say to Isaiah? I'm sick of your new moons, your Sabbaths, your feasts. And the same thing could apply. I'm sick of your liturgies uh, if your heart's not right. It doesn't matter to me. You're not gaining anything by doing your little... Your little rituals. <laughs> they were uh, also sharing hose, apparently. They were doing a little bit of wife swapping with the hose, uh, we're told here in uh, chapter 2. 
And they were mad at prophets. They were saying, shut up, Amos. Shut up, Hosea. Shut up, all you dumb prophets. We don't want to hear your your uh, right-wing conspiracy theories because we just want to have our human trafficking and our giant Lady Gaga sex orgy Super Bowl parties. Go away. Stop reminding us. And so the case is presented. The covenant lawsuit case is presented in Chapter 3, the case against Israel. Uh, out of all the families of the earth, I have shown special love towards you. Uh, therefore, I will exact <laughs> vengeance upon you. And so this is that text that we that we are reminded of, which is in Luke, where Jesus explains that in the first century, it, it is pr principally in the first century where the culmination of all the predictions of the prophets occur. That's the key point is the first century, not something 2000 years from now, not John Hagee, not Tim LaHaye, but in the first century. And Jesus says that, that, uh, upon you will come all of right. What was written of in the prophets. These are the days of vengeance in which all things written in the prophets must be fulfilled. And he's talking about that generation. He says it multiple times, right? In Luke 21, Matthew 23, 24, it's not talking about the end of the world there there's an application to the end of the world there's aspects to which yes it does for signify and even some of the minor prophets at times see foresee uh, the eventual end of the world as we know it before the creation of the new heavens and the new earth but the majority of these prophecies and these predictions are not talking about um rapture or any of that nonsense it's talking about the first century divorce of Israel. And that's what the book of the apocalypse is principally about is the covenantal lawsuit. And this is one of the, cr the crucial things that I want to, to stress here that I'm going to talk about in the second part is that, that there is a pattern that we're going to see throughout the minor prophets. This is key that matches up to the book of the apocalypse. And it wasn't until my most recent reading through that I started to notice that, that they all follow the same pattern where we're going to see the situation with the covenant people, the divorce, right? The, the filing of the lawsuit, so to speak, the complaints, the divorce, the prediction of the restoration in the, in the new age, the new era, the messianic era of the kingdom, uh, and the destruction and fall of the harlot, the whore. That same pattern is going to follow through in the apocalypse it's going to follow through in many of the major prophets, right? Isaiah, Ezekiel. Uh, and you're going to see that same pattern um, in the Olivet Discourse and in the, in the first century, right? The first century itself is the outplaying of this pattern where you have the, the divorce of Israel, the fall of not just Israel, but it's Israel in concert with Rome. That's what the woman riding the beast is, is apostate Israel and Rome. And then that covenantal universal transition period of the first century gives way to the beginning of the Messianic period, which is the period we live in now, the, gen the Gentile church period. That doesn't mean that it's only Gentiles, not some Christian identity, heresy, serpent seed nonsense. All that means is that it's the period in which the church, which in its root is Jewish, is opened up to the Gentiles. And so that's how, for the past 2,000 years, all these Gentiles have been converting to worshiping the God of Israel. It's, 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 an, it's not that difficult. That's what's been happening. And that's what the prophets are talking about. And the way that you know this, the way to prove this, to show this for sure, is to simply look at the way that the New Testament interprets all these prophetic texts. Look at the way Acts talks about it, the way Acts talked about Hosea 14 and the fallen tabernacle of David being restored in the early church at Pentecost, look at the way Jesus interprets these texts. When he cites them, he always cites them as referring to the first generation, the, or the first century of the generation that's presently in front of him. Um, and we'll see that same pattern matches up perfectly to the apocalypse. And this is why many church fathers, by the way, teach that the apocalypse is about the first century destruction of Israel and in a mirrored sense, the end of time. These patterns repeat in history. That's what's key to see here. So that's why we see the Maccabees talking about the abomination of desolation. It happens under Ptolemy in 3rd Maccabees. Uh, it happens, uh, the abomination of desolation happens back before all that, excuse me, in the period of Daniel uh, with the, the Babylonians, Babylonian captivity. 
then up into the Maccabean period, abomination of desolation, right? So the temple keeps getting desecrated. And then eventually in the period of the first century, you have the complete removal of the Mosaic temple administration, all predicted in all these texts. That's what Jesus says. He says, you first century people here in front of me, you're going to see the abomination of desolation when the, when the temple is destroyed, when the Romans come in, uh, blaspheme it and so forth. Then it gets removed. That was the period in which you had the transition from from the old administration to the new covenant, to the administration of the church. Pentecost is the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth in its fullest, truest sense, the coming of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> right? Where Jesus predicts this at the end of John, he breathes on the apostles and says, "You, if you remit sins, they're remitted. If you retain sins, they're retained. Uh, and the founding of the church in Acts 2. And then throughout the book of Acts, you have the controversy periods of how are the Gentiles going to be brought into the church? And they've already decided it. And the Orthodox Church has continued that tradition. We are the church of the first thousand years. Everyone admits this. Everyone knows this. We're the, still the same church of the second thousand years. <laughs> so uh, this is the real Israel here, right? It, the Orthodox Church is the true spiritual Israel, the continuation of what you're reading here. Uh, so in the next section, we're going to talk about the rest of Amos, and we'll talk about uh, Micah and the amazing predictions in Micah about the birth of the Messiah that some of the strongest proofs actually, right? The birth in Bethlehem. Uh, so you can go to Jay's analysis. Uh, you can subscribe there to hear my full talks, lectures, and interviews, and you can click like below, leave comments, what you think, what you'd like to see more of. If you like the theological stuff, you want to see more of the comedy stuff, whatever you're into, tell me what you want to see more of. I would appreciate that. That helps me gauge what the audience wants, what you guys like, uh, and share it. And be sure to hit the bell for notifications because if you don't, you're going to miss out on a lot of my talks. God bless you guys and have a great day.